as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village ahead of you. And when you arrive there, you will find a donkey tied, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Tell them the Lord needs it, and he will send it back shortly. So they went and found a colt standing outside, tied at a doorway. When they untied it, some people standing there asked them, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus told them, and the people let them go. After they had brought it to Jesus and laid their cloaks on it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others took palm branches that they had cut from the fields and spread them on the road. And those that were before them and those that came after them shouted, Hoshana, Baruch Hava, Vashem Adonai, Baruchat, Melchot, David, Abinu, Fava'a, Hoshana, Bameromim. Now save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Save us in the highest of heights. And then Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything. But since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And this is the story that stands behind and inspires the beautiful act of worship that we saw in our children this morning. This story is the reason that we call today Palm Sunday and place greenery all around our sanctuary. And this church is the story that our faith, our community has called for 2,000 years the triumphal entry of Jesus. In short, this story describes the last mile or so of a long pilgrimage journey that Jesus and a number of his followers had made from their home up in Nazareth, Galilee, Capernaum in the north, all the way down to the city of Jerusalem, to the capital. They've come to the city to celebrate the Passover feast, which is one of the three pilgrimage sacred holy festivals for God's people been a long journey, especially this last little bit. It's been a hot uphill climb from Jericho to the Mount of Olives, where our story today begins. Jerusalem that week was getting busier and busier and busier. According to the historian of the Jewish people, a man named Josephus, during Passover week, the city swelled to a population of over three million people. It was crazy full. But this week, the spotlight is going to shine. The, the gazes of the throngs will be fixed on one man, Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth. This is the story of how his last week begins with a colt, with palms, with praises. And I want to suggest to you this morning, with one of the most peculiar anti-climaxes in all the pages of the Bible. Let's study the story together. Will you join me this morning? If you haven't opened your Bible yet to Mark 
chapter 11. Will you do so right now? And then also flip in your bulletin to page 7, where you'll find an outline and some notes so that you can jot down some observations and some uh, reflections on the teaching this morning to have as a reference for later. Let's discover this morning what God would have us learn and become on this Palm Sunday 2018. I want to start this message actually by throwing out a couple of things from the story, uh, sharing them with you that I think are pretty cool. Just out of curiosity, how many of you are familiar with the term Easter eggs? Easter eggs. Now, by Easter eggs, I'm not referring to the, to the chocolate treats or the plastic eggs that kids look for uh, on the grass or underneath bushes uh, during Holy Week. Those Easter eggs that I'm referring to are, are little nuggets of detail or little hidden references inside a bigger story or movie. Sometimes you're watching a movie and you'll see a cameo of someone you weren't expecting. That's a little Easter egg. Or there'll be a, some little pop culture reference uh, that you'll identify the second time through watching the movie. It's just a little nugget, something that you'll notice and you'll realize later, that's kind of cool how they fit that in. That's cool how they slip that in there, Easter eggs. Well, this morning, I want to suggest to you that the triumphal entry is a narrative that is packed with something like biblical Easter eggs. There are all kinds of little details, if you're paying close attention, little allusions in this story that lift out some cool angles and observations into the heart of Jesus, our Savior. This involves this morning what I call putting some pieces together and also taking some pieces apart. I want to start by just putting some pieces together because that's what Jesus' followers did along the roadside there, either in that immediate moment or followers later as they were reading this story as Mark wrote it down. They recognized that the triumphal entry, this scene that they were witnessing or reading about, was the fulfillment of all kinds of Old Testament anticipation. I call this story, the triumphal entry, the great coming true of many of the Old Testament prophecies about the true king of Israel. Now, we don't have time to actually look at all these passages in detail, but I do want to list them out for you. Mark 11, either by direct quote or uh, through allusion, is connecting the story of Jesus riding into Jerusalem with at least five and perhaps many more stories and songs and prophecies from the Old Testament. There are Easter eggs throughout this passage. I just want to show you these on the screen very quickly. 2 Kings chapter 9, Jehu said, here's what he told me. This is what the Lord says, I anoint you king over Israel. And they quickly, check this out, took their cloaks and spread them under him on the bare steps and said, Jehu is king. The king over Israel rides in on cloaks spread on the road. Zechariah chapter 14, verses 2 through 5, I will gather all the nations to Jerusalem to fight against them. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as he fights on a day of battle. On that day, his feet will stand where? On the Mount of Olives. And then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with them. Do you see the triumphal entry in that story? Look at 1 Kings chapter 1. Verses 43 to 45, our Lord King David has made his son Solomon king. The priests and prophets have put him on the king's mule, and Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet have anointed him at Gihon. You have to know that as Jesus descended down the Mount of Olives, he passed very close to the spring of Gihon, same place. And from there they have gone up cheering. And the city resounds with it. And look at Psalm 118. Lord, save us. Hosanna. Grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless you. The Lord is God and he has made his light shine on us. With bows in hand, we join in the festal procession. 
And then especially, last one, Zechariah 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. See, church, the triumphal entry story from Mark chapter 11 and the other gospels is not the fulfillment of just one or two but a whole pile of Old Testament predictions about the true king who would come to reign. And the more that you would look at this story like a Jewish person, or the more that you would observe Jesus as someone who is yearning for freedom and liberation from the Romans who ran the joint, the more beautiful and more textured and more inspiring this story would be to you. And the more that you look at Jesus at the center, riding on that colt in command and control of this extraordinary event, the more you recognize that look of determination in his eye. Jesus is committed to living out these prophecies. Jesus knows what he is here for. He knows that the time for which he has been sent is drawing close. And look at Jesus. He's not shying away from this moment, not in the least. This is the great coming true of so much that the people have been looking forward to, hoping for. These ancient prophecies about the Messiah are now being manifest on this triumphal entry ride into Jerusalem. There are amazing insights to be found by reading the New Testament stories in light of Old Testament prophecies. Amazing things emerge. You realize fulfillment, things that people had been praying for, hoping for, dreaming of, were coming true. But check this out. There are also beautiful things that you can see in this passage by actually taking some things apart, taking the pieces apart as if parts of a puzzle and looking at them individually. Now, what do you mean by that, Pastor Tim? Well, one of the really noteworthy things about the story of the triumphal entry is that it's actually one of only a handful of stories in the New Testament that are recorded in all four of the New Testament Gospels. As I've shared with you before from this pulpit, all of the writers of the Gospels, I mean, they all knew way more about Jesus than they wrote down. That means that they had to make choices about what they were going to put into their Gospels. You know, they had limited amounts of time and, and limited amounts of parchment, And they had to make decisions about which stories from Jesus' ministry they were going to include. And Matthew and Mark and Luke and John all make different decisions about what they want to tell. But to a person, four for four, all of them included the account of the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And for people who are familiar with this story... Uh, the same kind of thing can happen that happens with our Christmas stories. And that is that we will uh, often blend multiple accounts together into one story. I mean, this 19th century painting from the French artist Jean Flandrin does the same thing. It kind of like shares all of the stories in one image. And a lot of us, when we close our eyes and we picture the triumphal entry in our minds, we try to do the same thing. We, we have a, a composite kind of mashup of multiple gospel accounts and gospel stories. It's Matthew, actually, and only Matthew, that tells us that there are two animals, both a donkey and her colt. It's only in John that we're told that the branches come from palm trees. Did you know that? Luke refrains from using the word Hosanna at all, but he's the one who tells us that if the people are shushed, the rocks by the side of the road will start to cry out and sing. John, in his gospel, focuses on people coming out of the city of Jerusalem to see Jesus, while Matthew, Mark, and Luke 
put their attention mainly on the people who are riding in to the city, walking into the city with Jesus. Now, I want you to know that there's nothing wrong uh, with mashing up these stories together and having kind of a composite view of the story. Realize that the Gospels are far more complementary than, than we would think of them being con contradictory. But what I want to do this morning is take the next couple of minutes just isolating Mark's version, pulling on his thread that's been woven together into the cord of the narrative that is about the triumphal entry. Because it's here at chapter 11 of his gospel, church, and notice this, that a major, major shift takes place. For most of his gospel, Mark depicts Jesus as kind of wanting to keep a lid on his true identity as the Messiah. So when Jesus, in, in the book of Mark, goes out and he heals people, does miracles, Jesus is kind of like telling people to keep it quiet. Don't say anything. Just keep it low key, sort of under the radar. If you want to flip in your Bibles to Mark 8, just a couple of pages back for a moment, here's just one example of how Jesus does this, starting at verse 27. Look at low-key Jesus here, under-the-radar Jesus. Jesus and his disciples, it says, went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, well, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? And Peter answered, you are the Messiah. And look at verse 30. And Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Peter says the right thing. He gets it correct. Jesus, you're the Messiah. And Jesus is like, just tone it down a little bit, Peter. And this happens a number of times in Mark's gospel. That's how it goes in his book. Jesus is restrained about his true identity. He's deliberate and patient and unassuming. Jesus wants to keep this stuff on the down low. Wait. He says, wait, wait. Quiet, quiet. Just not yet, not yet. That's how Mark goes. Until you get to chapter 11. And that's where church everything changes. It's time for Passover, and the people are fired up, and excitement is building, and the great capital city rises before them to the west, and it's as if Jesus says right now, all right, it's go time. No more keeping it a secret. No more hush-hush. No more download. Let's light this firework and let everybody know who I really am. And for the disciples who've, who've been sitting on this for a long time, who've been, had to be quiet about what they've seen for three years, they're like, woohoo, let's do this thing, all right? Jesus says, get me a colt, and Jesus doesn't stop people from shouting Hosanna, and he rides on like King Jehu, and he steers toward the spring of Gihon, and he looks at the waving branches, and suddenly the secret isn't a secret anymore. There's a crescendo that rises among the people that day. The kids in the street are dancing. The men are like fist pumping, you know. Old people are, are wiping tears from their eyes as they sing Psalm 118. You know, the place is just crackling with anticipation. Hosanna, Hosanna, now's the time. And everybody's dropping their cloaks. And over here is this group of teenagers, and they're just jumping up and down to Seven Nation Army. You know, they're like, oh, 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 oh. They're just going nuts. And women are crying. And probably Thomas and Bartholomew, who've been holding it in for so long, probably look like this. You know, it's happening. It's happening. Save us now. And the crowds get bigger and bigger, and salvation comes closer 
and closer. The orchestra is soaring. The timpanies are pounding away. Salvation is coming. And the whole scene is like a tea kettle. It's rattling. It's pulsing with energy. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. And the lid's about to come off because it is happening. Here we go. Jesus is on his way to the holiest place on the face of the planet. The temple, the roller coaster is at the summit. And here we go. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. And then nothing happens. Here's exactly what Mark intends to convey in verse 11. Jesus looks around the temple and he checks his watch and he says, will you look at the time? And he heads back to his hotel room. That's really what Bethany was, his hotel room. That's it, Jesus? That's the end of this thing? Can it be a triumphal entry if there isn't even really a triumph? Night comes, and the palms are picked up, the cloaks are off the ground, the donkey's back with her master, and there are no more shouts of Hosanna. There was so much expectation. The plot was intensifying. The tension was rising. Everything was moving in a clear direction, and then crickets, right? There's that slide. That's not the right slide. I've lost my cricket slide. There we go. Crickets. None of us were present in Jerusalem that night. But we've all been there, haven't we? When our spiritual journeys have turned from Hosanna moments to cricket moments. We've expected big things, but we haven't received them. We've gone on fire for Jesus one day to quiet and silence and wondering the next day. That's it, Jesus? That's all you're going to do? That's all that's going to happen here? That's the end of things? You went to Rocky Mountain High, and and your hands were up as you were singing, and you were praising God, and, and you heard a great message, and you committed your life to Jesus, and then somewhere on the bus ride home, you went from the Mount of Olives to the bottom of the hill and back to Bethany. And there were crickets. You went through a a period of spiritual growth, some of you, and you're ready to give up everything for Jesus. The palm branches of your heart were waving. You were dialed in. You were invested big time in what God was doing in your life. And you sensed Jesus was super duper near. And then a couple weeks later, you were back to exactly the way you were before. Some of you were praying through a crisis and just it was like the Spirit was just wrapping you up in a blanket and you were so connected with God and you felt this movement. You were being pulled. You were being sent. You were being called. You were being lifted. Something was seriously happening. And then two days later, it's like just Jesus is back in the hotel room again. Is that it, Jesus? Is that all? I thought we were going somewhere. I thought something was happening. How, church, do we handle this? What do we do with spiritual crickets? Can we share about this for the last few minutes? I want to give you some thoughts on how to live through those moments when Jesus returns back to the hotel room, metaphorically speaking. 
when the hour isn't right. And Hosanna's turned to crickets. Well, the first thing to notice, I think, is that God is always at work, even in the silence. Even in the quiet, God's up to something. Jesus, Mark says, looks around the temple, looks at everything. Jesus is totally aware of what needs to happen, even if it seems like things are quiet. I love the old preacher's story about an elderly couple who was debating which one of them had worse hearing loss. It went on for some time, and the husband decided he was going to settle this issue once and for all. So while his wife was enjoying a book in the living room, he said from the kitchen, Dear, would you like a cup of tea? When he got no answer, he came out of the kitchen and said it again in a firm voice, Dear, can I get you a cup of tea? Still, there was no reply from his wife. Finally, he went into the living room and stood directly behind the chair in which his wife was sitting. In an even louder voice, he repeated, Dear, would you like a cup of tea? And she turned to him with a slightly annoyed expression on her face and said, For the third time, yes, yes, yes. Even when we can't hear the way we want to hear, or see what we want to see. Even when there are no hosannas in our ears and we don't have the sight of palm branches before us or sense the crescendo, God is at work. Jesus is king when he's riding from Bethany and Jesus is king when he's walking back to his hotel room in Bethany. Let me share with you three closing thoughts about this, but... but, I'm going to suggest that they only work if you preach them to yourself. Okay, you can hear them from me, and they can just go in one ear and out the other, or or bounce off. But if you can learn to preach these to yourself, you can get through those spiritual crickets moments. All right? The first thing is this. When it seems like Jesus isn't coming through, and all that you experience is spiritual crickets, it is not the fact that your faith is too weak. It is not the case that your faith isn't strong enough. You know, I've heard that so many times. Pastor Tim, this, I'm, I'm going through this just very difficult, dry period in my life with God, and I know it's because I, I just don't have strong enough faith. If I really believed, Pastor Tim, then The things that I want to happen will start happening, but my trust in God must be too weak because God is not sending me the blessings that I've expected. Church, the volume of your faith is not what matters. I need for you to feel that today and receive that and preach that to yourself. It is not that your faith is too small. What matters is who your faith is in. The object of your faith, the source of your faith, matters far more than the size of your faith. So here are two people, and they're both about to board ships across the ocean. The first one here is terrified of water, super duper scared to make this journey, and all the faith that she's got is required of her just to get on that ship and leave port. But her boat is solid. It's been inspected. It's been tested. It's watertight. It's secure. Now here is a man with ultimate confidence who worries for nothing. He swaggers up the gangplank. But there is an enormous hole in the bottom of his ship. Who's going to make the trip? Who's going to survive the crossing? Is it the person with great faith or the person with the right boat? It is not the measure of your faith that activates the miracles of God. Your faith, Jesus says, can be as small as a mustard seed if you plant it in Jesus Encountering spiritual crickets is not about having 
weak faith. And like I said, this is a message some of you really, really need to hear and let go all the way down into your soul this morning because your grandkids aren't turning out the way that you hoped that they would. And you blame yourself. You blame your prayer life. Others, if you just need healing to happen in your body or in your marriage, but it's not occurring on the timeline that you hoped and you loathe yourself, for having doubt. You can't even remember to do your devotions and you are furious with a person you see in the mirror for not coming through. You think, my faith, my spirituality just stinks and that's why I'm not getting from God what I expect to get from God. Church, never let the enemy discourage you by telling you that it depends on you. Do not let Satan deceive you by telling you that it depends on your effort. This is Jesus' work. Keep following, keep praying, keep looking, keep listening. Even if it feels like you're walking away right now from the Jerusalem you want to conquer, you can move a mountain if you place that mustard seed of faith in the right person. It is not that your faith is too weak. Now, here's maybe what it could be. It could be that your patience is too short. What is the cry of the triumphal entry? Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Now, Hosanna doesn't just mean save us. It means save us now. The word now is the easiest Hebrew word to translate because now is not. Now is not, especially if you do it with a Tennessee accent, like get over here right now. Now, 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 now. Hosanna, Hos- save us now. Now, we want it now. Church, God never ignores what God knows to be urgent, but God is never captive to what you feel to be immediate. I'll say that again for you. God never ignores what he knows to be urgent, but he's never captive to what you feel is immediate. There are things you believe have to happen this instant, but God doesn't agree. There are things you wanted to happen yesterday, and God's like, that's eh, not it. You're crying, save me now, do it now. Now's a good time, God. How about now? How about now? God's like, not yet. Several centuries ago, a Japanese emperor paid a high commission to an artist to have this artist paint him a picture of a bird. A number of weeks passed, which turned into months and then years. And the artist never returned with his painting. Finally, the emperor became so exasperated that he went to the artist's home to demand an explanation. But instead of making excuses, the artist whipped out a blank canvas on the easel, and in less than an hour, he completed a painting that by any measure was a masterpiece depiction of a bird. When the emperor asked the reason for the delay, the artist showed him armloads of drawings that he had made of feathers and wings and heads and feet. He had been researching and preparing for years. And all of that was necessary before in an hour he could make a masterpiece. God, do it now, now, now. Jesus is preparing something incredible for your life. He's getting things ready. He's working. The schedule is set. And church, sometimes it's just going to take a little bit longer. It's going to take a little. In fact, turn to someone next to you right now and just tell them it's going to take a little longer. Just tell them that. It's going to take a little bit longer. It's going to take a little longer. Through the years, I've heard this line 
that says, the line is, Jesus will never disappoint you. And I understand the meaning of that. Jesus is never going to discourage you or ne- Jesus is never going to let you down. But in another sense, Jesus disappoints us all the time. By that I mean, check this out, Jesus disappoints our plans. We have appointments set for Jesus. We have appointed him to do things on a certain schedule, and Jesus disappoints them. Jesus is the one who sets the times and seasons. He sets the dates. He sets the schedule. I mean, just imagine if you've got a meeting with the king or, or with the president, or, or you have, you've got a meeting that needs to happen with the one surgeon in the world who can save your life. You don't say, well, surgeon, let me see if I can fit you in. You don't say, Mr. President, let me see if I can just check my Google calendar here and let me see if I can slot you in somewhere. Uh, King, I know it seems like it, seems like it would be, it, let, let me check, next week's better for me. No, you let them set the schedule, don't you? Sometimes the experience of spiritual crickets, of us saying, that's it, Jesus, is simply the experience of Jesus putting the plans on his calendar at just the perfect time. Sometimes our patience is too short. But in the end, you know what's happening with spiritual crickets almost every time? It's that our dreams are too small. It's not that we're asking too much of Jesus. It's that we're asking too little of God. You know, the people with the palm branches, they looked at Jesus. They said, here's the guy. Here's the one who can change everything. Jesus, this is the one who can overthrow the Romans. This is the one who can break the yoke of the Pharisees, who can end the corruption of the institutional temple system. That was the dream of the people with the palm branches. They said it. They said, we want to have things back the way they were when David was in charge. And all those things would have been good things, right? Ending the Roman occupation would have been a good thing. Teaching the Sadducees a little bit about what spiritual health really looks like would have been helpful. But you know what? Jesus had bigger dreams than that. He had something more important on the calendar. Jesus had clear vision. I once heard another pastor say that having a clear vision means that you are willing to sacrifice the good for the sake of the great. See, Jesus didn't come to earth for good things. Jesus didn't mount a colt or ride to Jerusalem for a good thing. Jesus was sent for the ultimate thing. Because there existed and there exists a more terrible oppressor than the Caesar. And that was the one who needed to be overthrown. There's a more existential threat to your heart than Rome. And that's what needed to be defeated. There were deeper issues than the Pharisees. And what needed to happen in Jerusalem was not unto another 40-year regional kingdom like David established. Here today, gone tomorrow. Jesus didn't come for a good thing. He came to win cosmic victory. Jesus' ride in Jerusalem was a march of triumph to liberate the whole world. See, when we hear spiritual crickets, it's often that the story just isn't turning out the way we had planned. But church, God is writing an epic that surpasses the story you want to write a million times. It's greater in every way. God provides for what you truly need, not what you in the moment feel like you got to have. He inaugurates a kingdom beyond your dreams. And remember what Tim Keller says. I love this line. God always provides what you would ask for if you knew what he knows. God always provides what you would ask for 
if you knew what God knows. Jesus rides on toward the victory you really ultimately require. We'll consider it Thursday night. I hope you'll be here. Because victory will come. But it will not be signaled with green, beautiful palms. It will be about a different kind of branch. A barren branch. A lifeless tree, stark against the skies of Golgotha. It's not come the end of this week about riding on in victory. It's about staggering forward, one foot after another, in agony. Triumph will come in washing feet that are uncushioned by cloaks and ferns. Ultimate victory will come not by wiping out the Roman hordes, but on the day that the true king died for his enemies. When it truly matters, there will be no hosannas, only hecklers. The king is coming because the king is coming to his end. That's it, Jesus. That's it. That's it. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you. We need you. We've been looking for a king for so long. We pray that you would change our hearts so that we might not be dictating the terms of your inauguration that we might not be writing policy for our ultimate Lord. That instead, we might follow you into the city and back out. That we might follow you ultimately to the cross and there witness what the King came to do. We pray this prayer in his name. The name of Jesus, the name at which every knee will bow. Amen.